to be commenting. Yes, Kyle. I have a question. Okay, what's your question? How is um Daughter? One that is supposed to have heart surgery. She's supposed to have it in the next couple of weeks, in the middle of the month. Um, he has been very busy with everything that needs to be done in preparation of that. He's also wanting to move back here, so they're having to decide whether they're going to have a house built, and that's where he's thinking they're leaning. Uh, but I haven't talked to him. I was going to call him today after church to see just how everything is going. Because again, I know that the surgery is coming up. So he's another one that you want to constantly keep in prayer. Um, the reason why I asked, because nobody mentioned her. The surgery yeah. hasn't happened yet. I know, but, but, but um, nobody mentioned him. Ricky, have you talked to him? It's been about a week. Okay. What was the last thing that you had heard? Uh, he's looking to build a house. And, yes. Um, and that may put off his plans of actually when he moves down here. It could be October, and then because their they their lease runs out two months before they move here, and they're they're concerned about they don't want to move twice. Right. Which I don't blame them. Right. So, it, but it's kind of messing up the school year too. So, you know, if he wants to move twice, I'm sure that you know, some of us can help him out. Right. So he's got a lot that's going on, so definitely keep him, his wife, and his family in prayer. So keep your Bibles open to Genesis, and if they're not open, turn them to Genesis. Before I start this morning, I want to apologize to you from the last time that I spoke. Um, I got a little too uh, political, and I understand that. And again, I apologize to you and seek your forgiveness and Amen. promise you that it will happen again. Amen. Um, as you look at Genesis chapter 4, you come to the story of Cain and Abel. You find out that it says in the process of time that both of them brought an offering to the Lord. Okay? And that God had respect for one, and he didn't have respect for the other. Why do you think that was? Why did God like Abel's offering? And why did he not like Cain's? Disobedience. It's work. It's Disobedience? Right. I heard somebody say something about works. Right. What I want to ask you is that when... Adam and Eve sinned, and God cast them out of the garden. Did God continue to talk with them? Do you remember that before they sinned, God would meet them in the cool of the evenings? And He would come down, and they could visibly see Him. But what happened after they sinned? Could they stand in His presence anymore? Was He able to still communicate with them? How? By, say it loud. By his angels. Because you're right. By his angels. What is the definition of the word angel? Messenger. Okay. So I want you to understand this, that God still communicated with Adam and Eve, and hence he also communicated with their children. And you're going to find that out as we continue looking at this passage. So Genesis chapter 4 says verse 3. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. In verse 5, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Number one. Why was God happy with Abel's offering? What did Abel bring? A lamb, right? So why was this pleasing to the Lord? Hold on, hold on. Judy, what did you say? Now listen, this is very important because a lot of churches 
uh, I had the word and I just forgot it, are dispensationalists. And you had the dispensation of the law, dispensation of grace. I'm not really sure where they put Adam and Eve. Okay? But what I want you to see, what Judy brought out, is that Adam and Eve, when they sinned, God gave them the requirements of what he wanted to be able to approach him. And God was very specific in what he required. And you can find this out by this text. Cain came in a certain way, and Abel came in a certain way, and God had respect for one and didn't have respect for the other. So, Ricky, why was the animal offering, why was that important to God? What did you say before? Okay. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Okay? So, when you sin, to have forgiveness of that sin, it required the shedding of blood. <coughs> Never forget that, because it's the same today. Okay? That the sin that we create and that we do, the penalty for that is your life. And it doesn't matter whether it's what we consider a small white lie or whether you're a murderer. Any disobedience to God, the penalty for that is what? Yes. God, and you have to remember this as well, God is just in that requirement. Do you know why? Have you ever thought about that? Why is God just in requiring a life for your sin? All you have to do is look at the results of what sin has done to this world. Amen. And all the pain and all the misery, and you realize that disobedience from God's law, from God's plan, from God's way, only results in misery and death. And it just keeps spiraling. Jim? More than that, it shows what it shows that uh, if Christ failed on the cross, then Satan would, the accuser of God, would be able to show that God was at fault. Mm. Because, because God is on trial for the universe. Yes. Amen. So, listen. We, in our day, we have the Bible, right? And we have the complete Bible. Did Cain and Abel have that? No. But listen, what did they have? They had God that spoke to them through his angels, right? They weren't left in ignorance. When Adam and Eve sinned and God came to them and they said to God, we realized we were naked and we were afraid, God said, who told you you were naked? How did you know? Have you eaten from the tree? What does it say after that, that God did? It said God clothed them. Did they not try to clothe themselves? Yeah. Right? What did they use? Some type, of, some type of vegetation, right? What did God clothe them with? How did God get the skin from the animals? Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin, right? So, in that one instance, God showed them the sacrificial system. That this blood is symbolic of the blood that will come and cleanse you from all sin. Why do you think in the verses prior to 3, when Eve had her first child, she says, I acquired a child, a man-child from the Lord. Who did she think that child would be? The Savior. The Redeemer. Wow, this is going to happen quick. Praise Jesus. Praise God. Did it happen quick? No. No. Okay. So, because God had a plan. And God had His timetable. Right? So listen, when it comes to Cain and Abel, you're going to find here the beginning of the distinction between human religion and true religion. <clears throat> that Cain tried to approach God on Cain's terms. He wanted a God made in his own image. Amen. And Abel approached God on God's terms. Amen. Abel 
worship the true God and understanding His place in front of that God. That He was a sinner who could only find redemption and salvation from this God. This God of righteousness and this God of justice. And this God had a specific way to attain that. So you find that they both bring their offerings. God accepts Abel's. How did Abel know to bring a lamb offering? Well, the Bible says he raised sheep. What else was he going to bring? It wasn't that case. Abel, or Cain, he worked and grew vegetation. He brought what he had. But God was specific. Is that right? And that's what I want you to understand. God was very specific. How do you know that God told them what he wanted? Because after Cain killed Abel, God spoke to him, and he didn't freak out. You ever think about that? God speaks to him. He doesn't stand back and go, wow, who is that? He actually has a, <clears throat> excuse me, a dialogue and a conversation with God, and he's still upset. Right? He's still, so that's telling you that he had a certain comfort level in speaking with God. You have to get that out of the text, right? So that's telling you that God spoke to them, that they understood what God wanted. But after the fall and after sin, Cain wanted to approach God again on his terms. And that's not what God had ordained. So let's continue to look at these texts. <clears throat> says that in verse 5, he did not respect Cain and his offering. Now listen, can you get that? He didn't just not respect his offering. What does it say? He did not respect him or his offering. That's what got him upset. That's what made him really, really mad. Now with that anger, I want you to see how quickly sin just raised, you said, snowballs. Did Cain come with his offering, and was he upset before he brought his offering? No. He came to worship God, and he wanted to show God what he did, right? And he's bringing the best of what he did, of what he produced, and he wanted to bring it to God as an offering. He wanted to worship God. So he didn't come upset or in a bad mood, but what happened? When God respected Abel and didn't respect him, pride turned into anger, turned into jealousy, turned into murder. The snowball effect of sin. This is why God is righteous and just in requiring my blood for my sin. Because there's no difference between me and Cain. Right? The only difference is Jesus Christ living in my heart. So, verse 6, so the Lord, anyway, Cain was angry, verse 5, and his countenance fell. And God saw it, right? So God was still watching after he accepted Abel's, and God started to speak to him. And you don't find Cain asking, who are you, what are you talking to me for? He talked back to them like they had conversations before, right? So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? Verse 7, If you do well, will you not be accepted? What does that verse mean? If you do well, will you not be accepted? That means specifically that God had a specific way and criteria to approach him, right? And that Cain knew that. And he tells him, if you do well, if you do what I have commanded, things will go well with you. So it also tells you that Cain chose to come to God in a different way. The start of humanistic religion. Okay? And it's still here on this earth today. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, what lies at the door? 
Sin lies at the door. And sin's desire is to rule over you. But you shall rule over it. Okay? So, right there it's plain. Do you have to be a slave to sin? No. What did God tell Cain? Sin's there. It's lying at the door. But if you do well, you can rule over it. What does he mean if you do well? If you follow what I have instructed, and if you approach me in my way, and that is through Christ. For Jesus said, there is no other way that man can approach God except through him. Right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Did that only mean in the dispensation of grace? That was from the fall of Adam to their children all the way to the last day of this earth's history. Amen. Right? There's one way, and that way is Christ. Verse 8, Now Cain talked with Abel his brother. Now don't you find it strange that he talked with God, God explained this to him, and he still held that anger and jealousy in his heart? There's a lesson there I want you guys to not just pass over. I want you to understand just how strong sin is and how strong anger and jealousy and envy can be. This is why God doesn't like it. God spoke to him. Now, has God ever spoken to you where you actually heard his literal voice to tell you, don't do this? Don't you think you would listen? And yet Cain held on to these feelings. Not only that, but does this sound premeditated? He planned this out. Come here, brother. Let's go out into the field. Spirit of Prophecy tells you in Patriarchs and Prophets why they went into the field. Because they were going supposed to talk. And Abel was willing to talk this out with his brother because he knew his brother was mad at him. Okay? Uh, but his brother had other plans. So let's look. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against his brother. And did what? The first murder. I want you to put yourself in the shoes of Adam. When he finds out that his firstborn killed his brother. And realizing that it was because of his choice and put yourself in Eve's place. <laughs> How long did Adam live? Thousand years. Okay, nine hundred and some years. Do you realize there he saw seven generations of his family? Seven generations. Can you imagine how much evil and wickedness that he saw? Because Adam was able to see were almost and lived almost to when the flood came. But he saw the wickedness of the earth. And he saw where the heart and the intent of mankind was and was going. And he knew that it was because of that one decision. Again, uh, Patriarchs and Prophets tells you that those people who lived at that time, were they related to him? Yeah. Every one of them related to him. Okay? And they used to harass him about the decision that he made because they realized that it's because of your decision that we're suffering so badly. There was a little bit of truth to that. Adam had to pay a price for that, but those people made their own decisions. Okay? Now, when Abel died, God once again speaks to Cain. And I want you to understand and see how comfortable Cain is talking to God. If you just killed somebody, the first murder that ever take place on this earth, and God came to you, don't you think you'd do what Adam and Eve did and have to be try to hide yourself? Did Cain run and hide when God spoke? Does it mention anything about that? 
Does it mention Cain being afraid at all? Pride. You need to understand the depths of the darkness and pride. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And what response did Cain give? Do I know? Am I my brother's keeper? You just killed him. And now God's coming to talk to you. And that's how you respond to God. I look at these texts and I look at Cain and I try to put myself in his place and I realize that this man had hardened his heart to the point where he did not understand. Well, I can't say that. He did not care about what he just did. God spoke to him. Where is your brother? He just killed him. Am I my brother's keeper? Do we still use that? Yeah. Phrase today. Yeah. Now I also want you to see his response when God gives him his punishment. Yeah. Okay? Well, the pride goes then, right? Yeah. Listen now. This is the same type of attitude that Judas had after he betrayed Christ. Okay? The same type of attitude. When he saw what he did and realized that this is going to come back on his head, he says that he repented, but it wasn't true repentance. Okay? He was sorry because of the punishment that was coming and how he would be viewed. So look at verse 9 again. The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Verse 10, and God said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Cain doesn't speak after that, does he? So now you are cursed from the earth with his opened its mouth to receive your, blo your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. Now let me ask you a question. After Adam sinned, did God curse the ground? Okay. So now it was hard to get any produce. Now God's saying, you ain't going to get nothing, none at all. Okay? And Cain was thinking, man, it's hard now trying to get anything to grow. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is what? Greater, greater than I can bear. My punishment is greater than I can bear. Now, I want you to see the mercy of God. Why did God not just get rid of Cain? It would have made, would have made things, in my point of view, easier. Think about the history of, of Cain and his descendants. But is God all-seeing and all-knowing? Is there what we call a great controversy, a battle between good and evil going on? Is there players on both sides, on God's side and on Lucifer's side? Is God fair and just to allow Lucifer's side to have freedom and the opportunity to show what kind of characters they will have? Okay. That right. was the devil's idea. That if he got rid of Abel, things are going to be rocking and rolling. No pun intended at all. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because there would just be Cain. And he already had Cain in his pocket. Right? So listen. You need to realize that you are a player. And like on a chessboard, you're a piece on the chessboard of God's plan. And God has a purpose for you. And he has a will for you to play out in this plan. And God gives you the choice on which side you're going to play it out on. Whether you will choose God's side or Lucifer's side. What you need to understand is there's nothing in the middle. Right. If you don't choose God, you're going to choose the devil. Amen. And there are going to be plenty of people on that day who are going to be shocked because they're in the wrong line. I think I'm going to go back to work. So understand, there's no fence sitting when it comes to following and obeying God. 
So God gives him his punishment. He says, it's too much. And God in his mercy said, okay. Because Cain was worried that wherever he went, they would kill him. Who was it that would kill him? There you go. His family, right? Because they all came from Adam and Eve. Now here's the question. Who were these other people? There was only Cain and Abel and Adam and Eve. It doesn't say that. What it says is that Eve bore son, and she bore another son. But it also tells you that they had daughters and sons. Okay? So, and they had daughters and sons, and they had daughters and sons. And so you started to have population. Now, I've asked you this before, and I want to think about this. How long does it take to gestate a baby? Nine months. Right? Was it any longer for them? No. It should be the same, right? Nothing's changed. Now, if you live to be 900 years old and you could produce a child at like 60, and you could produce from 60 to let's say 400 years, how many children could you in your one family have? How many generations could you see? Adam saw, what I tell you, was it seven or nine generations and he was able to see. You see how quickly the earth could fill up. All right? So, that's, these were the people that he was worried about. Now, when he became a vagabond, what did it say he did? He started the first city. Why did he start a city? Because he couldn't be a farmer no more because the ground wasn't going to produce for him, right? So, if you lived with a bunch of people, better chance of having food to eat. But he moved away from where his mother and father were at. And from the start of that city is the demarcation line between the sons of God and the sons of men. Amen. Understand that? Because it tells you that the sons of God saw the sons of men, or the daughters of men, and they were fair. Okay? And you have churches that will tell you, well, those were God's children taking, or angels taking, you know what I'm saying? This was the line of Seth and the line of Cain. The children of God were of the line of Seth. Who was Seth? Any ideas? Say it loud. He was the replacement of Abel. That's right. When Abel died, it tells you that in the process of time, Eve bore another son, and his name was Seth. And he was the line of God's faithful. Okay? And the children of God, which came through the line of Seth, were followers of God. They did what Abel did, and that was listen to God and approached Him the way God had wanted. Not the way man had wanted. So this is important as you get to your day right now. Because what you're seeing in our world is this battle, this conflict, still playing out on a much larger scale with instead of families, now nations. Okay? But it's still this battle that started with Cain and Abel and then Seth, the children of God and the sons of men. Now, Gary, you have your hand up? Well, I just, that point you brought out in the Bible makes it real clear that Seth's children are called the sons of God. Mm. You know, they, they use this in so many ways that twisted up so bad that people need to understand that these were human beings, the sons of Seth, not from outer space. <laughs> they were the son and the children of the line of Seth. So let's go back and look at verse 12. This is where I finish. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you, a fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. Doesn't that sound strange? What was he worried about? Cain was worried that he would be hidden from the face of God. He realized that he needed God, that his protection came from God, but he still wanted to approach God on his terms. I want you to, you got to make this distinction because you start to see from his line all of the 
religions that are on the earth today that are not based on Christ. Okay? I always found that funny, that he was worried about being hidden from the Lord's face. 